this is John Cole with GrowingYourGreens.com. Today we have another exciting episode for him here in Sebastopol, California at 2185 Gravenstein Highway. And where we're at today is we're at the Permaculture Skills Center, which is also the site of the Permaculture Artisans. So this is all about permaculture today. And uh, you know, I want to share with you guys a story of the Permaculture Skills Center where I'm gonna give, give you guys a tour today. Basically, this is a five acre uh, plot that was purchased in late 2012, like winter 2012, and they started converting this site over into permaculture. So this basically houses two different companies, for-profit companies, the Permaculture Artisans, which is a successful permaculture landscape uh, designer, and they do a lot more in addition to remediation and all kinds of stuff, um, you know, for like over 10 years now. So they have a good solid background in doing this stuff. Just a few years ago, they opened the uh, Permaculture Skills Center, which is a for-profit business to teach and educate people about permaculture and you know expanding their skills to make it uh, sustainable in this uh, unsustainable world. And uh, you know the owner Eric, how he got into this was that he was a permaculture activist, you know, for many years, and he was living on a shoestring, didn't have a lot of money. Maybe like some of you guys watching, right? You're like, permaculture, man, it's the answer. And you try to do all these things with non-profit groups. And it really just doesn't really just seem to be making it and going to the next level and getting momentum and really exciting people and making the change you want to see in the world. So Eric, basically, he started his uh, permaculture artisans to basically in, do in, permaculture uh, installs and whatnot for people. That became actually very successful for him and he found out that he was actually better able to advocate and get permaculture out there by having a for-profit business. And you know, and then he was so successful with that, and then he started a place, Permaculture Skills Center, which gives permaculturists the skills, you know, uh, who don't have a business, who are not business-minded, to come here and teach them either how to do permaculture in uh, farming and gardening, you know, and have their own successful farm after they've learned all the skills, or come here for their educational programs to learn how to become, you know, a, a consultant with managing ecosystems and doing more whatever contracting, but it's, it's much more than that. It's, uh, you know, so that's really cool that they basically offer educational workshops here to people that want to take permaculture to the next level. Even if you're not into permaculture, you can come here and get a hands-on because, you know, on this five acres, uh, you know, when you're in a course, you actually do hands-on stuff. And since it's not all in the book, like many uh, courses are. So anyways, uh, without further ado, let's go ahead and start showing you guys some of the examples of permaculture in action at the Permaculture uh, Skill Center. So when the Permaculture Skill Center purchased this property back in 2012, basically all there was was like a house and five acres of clean slate. Now this is probably the best idea to get into if you want to start something yourself, a farm, a garden, you know. Um, it is to start with a clean slate because it's always easier to start with a clean slate and mold it and shape it how you want instead of you know building something from you know somebody else's mess ups <laughs> so i'm glad they got to do this and they, they took this property they remodeled the house and now it's their office and stuff and uh the next thing they did was they just brought in like uh, some heavy equipment to uh grade some uh land to basically catch and retain water this is in a watershed, so it's actually one of the wettest places in the county uh, during the winter season. So they created trench, trenches and valleys and culverts and all these things to divert the water to where they need it. So they have like ponds that catch the water so they could reuse the water, you know, later when it's not wet. Also, they have also things like a rain catchment that I'll show you guys in a little bit. So anyway, let's go ahead and show you guys uh, just this little example of where they're creating an ecosystem. Now, whether you guys have a home garden or a whole permaculture installation, I always encourage you guys to create habitat for you know, uh, native plants, the wild bees, the birds, and all this kind of stuff, because that's just gonna improve you know, the yields and improve the production and you know, improve the pest management in your very garden. So now we're looking at the habitat pond and waterfall and it's nice and serene in this area. They have a little seating here for eating your lunch or doing meetings or whatever they do. Uh, but you know just having a waterfall on your property will provide habitat and make a microclimate 
for different creatures and also allow you to grow things that you know maybe you're in a dry arid climate and having a little waterfall and a water feature will provide more humidity in the general area so that plants that would not thrive can now thrive in your environment in addition they are providing uh, you know uh, biomass and creating you know uh, different things they can compost or turn back into the soil in addition they're doing the aquaculture so they can produce fish and also other you know uh, plants that would normally like to live in water you know that they wouldn't be able to grow necessarily in the fields out there so you know basically permaculture is thinking about you know uh, nature as a whole system and uh, by keeping you know the earth happy the people happy the plants and the wildlife and taking all the different factors into consideration when designing your specific setup you know and some people might have like oh permaculture is this or it's that well you know it's it's everything and yes even row crops can be designed into a permaculture uh, you know a system if it meets your goals and that's the main thing you know one of the points I want to get across to you guys in this episode anyways let's go ahead and take a look at another way they're using the water to their benefit with the uh, rain harvesting they're doing so now what we're looking at is just a, a water catchment system they actually have on this like uh, shed building where they formerly sold some produce they use for workshops and meetings and whatnot and basically they put a gutter up there and as you guys can see the gutter runs into this little um, funnel deal and then in the funnel deal there's like a screen that they could easily clean so it keeps out all the big debris and then it goes into the PVC pipe that then goes into this big downspout thing you know the big PVC tube that goes to the bottom that you can't see has like a ball valve on the bottom but basically that's a Brazilian ball valve so right when it rains all the water immediately goes right into there and it's like the first flush of so the water that comes right off the roof in the beginning you don't want to use that so it goes down they could drain it off and then the ball there's a ball inside that big tube there that then floats up to the top it blocks it so now the water then after the first flush gets diverted you know into the big um, a cistern right there that catches all the water so you know in this way they could use the rainwater and this will basically take less of a load off the sewer system which is meant for sewage not necessarily for rainwater um, the other thing why it's good is because now you can irrigate your crops with the rainwater which in my opinion is much better than using like the city water that's been chlorinated and they add potentially other contaminants to or there's existing contaminants in there It'll reduce your water bills and also really good for emergency preparedness in case shit hits the fan one day, at least you'll have some kind of storage of water. So yeah, I would recommend all my viewers to at least get a 55 gallon barrel uh, to harvest at least 55 gallons of rainwater. All right, so now I'm on this little bridge thing here, just made out of wood, and basically this uh, wood goes over like a little a ditch or a gully here and this gully basically directs the water to where they need it so what you know when you get a blank slate it's really easy to come in and say hey I want to do this and direct the water into this pond or whatever but uh, basically they planted plants in at the bottom of the gully um, you know that are that like water you know that could deal with a lot of water and in addition they could direct the water uh, where they need it and they could plant things you know on top of the slope you know that'll soak up the water you know to to do water remediation so you know this is what they're doing here they're doing water harvesting and drainage so it recharges groundwater down below which means uh, less irrigation sediment and toxic mitigation from local waterways protect infrastructure and reduce flooding and drought proof the farm so i mean that's very important this day and age with water is a precious resource you know in california there's all over the you know water restrictions well why not collect the water you get naturally and use that to your advantage because I don't think there's laws yet <laughs> pertaining to collected water <laughs> in California but there are you know laws with collecting your water in other states quite unfortunately that I'm not in agreement with I mean they own everything so now I want to show you guys just like an example of some of the landscaping around here like the most the landscaping around here kind of looks like this right you're going to see different kinds of plants at different levels, serving different functions, serving different purposes. And this is what, in my opinion, would be a great substitute for a lawn, a standard green grass lawn that basically serves no purpose unless maybe you got kids and they plant it, but most people's kids have moved away and most people don't, most kids don't even play on the lawn anymore. They're just inside playing video games. 
hopefully they're watching my YouTube videos. But anyways, um, <laughs> but this would be a great replacement for a lawn, basically to pull up the lawn, you know, and pile in the wood chips, which are gonna hold water, which are gonna break down and provide fertility for the soil. You're then gonna plant fruit trees. We got a pear tree here. We got, I think, uh, another tr a fruit tree over there. Then we got like some echinacea or purple comb flower, which is a medicine. They got yarrow. They got some uh, lavender, which smells really nice. And they got all kinds of other little small ground cover plants that are playing a role in the whole ecosystem. I mean, beyond this, behind that fruit tree there, I don't know if you guys could see that, but they have uh, some autumn olive trees that are actually nitrogen fixing. So they're actually creating nutrition for the soil. They can also chop and drop all these to create more fertility as well. So, you know, this, this is water conserving, whereas grass, and lawns use too much water. Now, I always encourage you guys to do with your space the best use for what you want to do. Like for me, like putting this in my front yard would be a waste of space. And I'm not saying this isn't good. I'm just saying for me, my personal needs, like having a lot of wood chips and growing, you know, a scant amount of food would not be good. I have limited space. So I want to grow as much food as possible. So that's why I choose a grow and raised bed gardening and do biointensive method where I grow things really close together because that serves me more. Now, if you're maybe an older couple and you don't want to be out tending your vegetables every day, this would be great because this is relatively low maintenance. It's going to save water. And plus, you're going to get the benefits of some medicinal herbs and some fruits, uh, you know, when you want them. So, yeah, I always like to teach you guys good, better, best, right? Lawns, they're probably the worst, you know, growing your vegetable garden raised beds especially if you eat like most of us out there you know they're probably the best and this is somewhere in between but you know for the right person this would be great and i think every american should pull out their lawn and put something like this in and that it should be allowed everywhere in the world so what we're looking at now is the edible food forest area of the installation here and you guys can see they got some of my favorites the uh purple perennial tree collar just sprawling out all over they got some fruit trees here they got some lavender here and you know I like food forest as a system you know especially if you have a lot of space to dedicate to a food forest because that you could grow your own healthy food they run and maintain themselves or they're very low maintenance they're a wildlife habitat and beauty and they also provide erosion control so you know a really well designed food forest is great uh, because you will get food also it's low maintenance and that's why I like them a lot. But, you know, I, I personally feel that if, it, you know, in a small residential situation, you know, under an acre, you know, you're going to be sacrificing the volume of food you're growing, you know, uh, for a uh, food forest. I've had yet to see a really productive small scale food forest that produces a lot of food, you know, in a small space. I generally think that, you know, they, they're done in, in bigger situations, although I visited a really cool food forest uh, system down in Houston, Texas that I'll put a link down below. You guys can check that one out. But, you know, in general, I like to just grow lots of vegetables and standard vegetable beds and, you know, have some fruit trees mixed in around the perimeter. All right, so another thing I want to show you guys that they're doing is they're growing these guys right here. I don't know if you guys could see all the little yellow berries. This, these are yellow autumn olives and they're kind of like my sweet gomes. They're really cool. But, uh, down over here, I don't know if you guys can see that, but this is one of the little gullies where the water goes, you know, when it's uh, raining. So it fills up like a little river and they got a pathway over it. And uh, basically just in here, they're just putting all the, the chop and drop. So they're just putting cuttings of different plants, of trees and all this stuff in there uh, to rot down, which will feed their trees. So, you know, the best food for trees is other trees. Um, so that's really cool they're doing this and you know if you have a lot of space you can you can do this i mean it still looks very nice they got it all wood chipped in they just got some piles of this in the middle you know uh, i have a big challenge with aesthetics especially in a residential situation where you have neighbors close by people are watching over your place and you know they want it to look nice they don't want to see big piles of debris everywhere now if you got a farm this is more acceptable to have big piles of debris so for me personally in my small space I choose to compost in a compost pile, a compost tumbler, or send my, you know, uh, cuttings and food scraps off site to get composted, and then I bring back in the finished product. You know, so there's many ways to accomplish the same goal, whether you want to do it on site like this, and yes, if you don't chop it up, don't mix it in with, you know, carbon, nitrogen, and all this stuff, 
uh, you know, it will take longer to decompose, but guess what? Compost always happens. So no visit to Sonoma County wine country would be complete without showing you guys some grapes here. So they got grapes and these grapes are growing, you know, up uh, basically like a hog panel or utility panel uh, fence here. And I always encourage you guys to make use of your vertical spaces. So number one, this fence is providing multiple uses. It may be keeping animals out. You know, it's creating a boundary between one property and another. And it's also, you know, being able to grow food or grow something up it to provide privacy. And also more importantly, to provide food. And yes, you can eat the grapes when they're ripe, they're not quite ripe yet. And you could also eat grape leaves, you know, they use them to wrap in dolmas and you could juice a few here and there. Even, you know, I like to harvest the little baby ones and cut them up, add one or two to a salad. You know, I wouldn't eat a whole salad out of grape leaves. Um, but yeah, so there, I always want to encourage you guys to think beyond just like, oh, I'm growing grapes for food to eat. Well, how else can you use your grapes? Can your grapes be grown to offer shade or some privacy? And, you know, you could grow to create a microclimate. I mean, we want to start thinking like outside the box instead of thinking like with blunders on like most Americans are taught. We want to think about all the possibilities that are out there so that you can benefit most from the plants uh, that you grow on your property. So now I want to go ahead and take you guys just a, a walk through through the edible food forest and how it looks and just some of the trees and crops that are growing. So of course they got things like uh, comfrey growing down below and there's a uh, wildlife, there's a little lizard, I'm sure you eat some bugs. Here's a uh, apple tree growing and basically, uh, oh, there's the autumn, red olive, autumn olive and basically it's just a wood chip. So it's a nice, it's like an orchard, but it's not because they have, besides just growing the trees, which an orchard would just be, you know, just down the road, you could go to apple orchards and it's just all dusty dirt that blows everywhere. It looks terrible you know and the trees aren't as healthy as it can be but or they could be filled with something like this like all the wood chips which are decomposing creating black fungal dominated soil to feed the trees and, and to build the fertility of the land i want to always encourage you guys to leave friends homes you know or relatives homes nicer than when you got there and leave your property nicer and more fertile than when you originally bought it and that's definitely what they're doing here with all the wood chips and, you know and the fruit you know trees they're growing and a space that every maybe 15 feet and then they got even things you know down below the fruit trees you know that they could chop and drop to create more fertility you know the comfrey pulls up nutrients out of the ground they uh, chop them down they break down and then it feeds the tree so yeah all this is just you know just pretty much designed for the trees and the nice uh, you know wide pathways to walk through and then of course they have more of the little uh uh, gullies to catch the water direct the water to where they need it oh and check it out over on the other side they got standard row crops and that, yeah, they're doing a no-till method so uh, let's go over there and uh, show you guys that so now we're at another area of the property and this is where they have a lot of different uh, row crops growing under standard like drip irrigation now they're doing this differently than most commercial places would number one is that they're not tilling so they've actually just uh, uh, loosened the soil not through tilling and then they um, basically lay down a whole bunch of the wood chips and then they, uh, you know, in the pathways and whatnot, let that break down, that smothered out all the weeds. And then basically they bring in compost on top and then, uh, you know, they plant in the compost, not in the wood chips. And then they basically just have the drip uh, lines and then uh, this is like a recently planted right here. And then they also like uh, mulch with the straw, you know, without the seeds to save the moisture and save the water. So, you know, some people might believe like row crops are not a part of permaculture, but if it fits into your overall system, then yes, it can play a part because, you know, is a herb spiral, that means it's permaculture, or is it a sheet mulching, that means it's permaculture, is a food forest, that means it's permaculture. Like, I, I don't want you guys to think inside boxes, I want you guys to expand out. So this is a part of a system that meets their design goals you know, which is very important. You know, I personally like the raised beds a lot more than just the standard row crops, but I'm sure one day when I have acreage, I'll be having a raised bed section, I'll be having a row crop section, I'll be having a food forest section, I'll be having an aquaculture section, I'll be having an aquaponic section, I'll be having blah, blah, blah. So I'll like every section and it's gonna be so cool when I finally get some property to experiment and do all the different things, you know? And I, once again, I wanna encourage you guys to 
do whatever floats your boat, man. If you love row crops and you just want to do that, you could be very productive at row crops if you learn the right techniques. And here's a really cool thing. If you come here and go through the program here, through their farming program, you know, uh, for permaculture, the design, you know, uh, uh, aspect of permaculture to like become a landscape designer, you know, they have areas on the property that you could actually, you know, they could be an incubator. So if you go through the farming program, they could provide you some space so that you can farm it. You can get your foot in the door. You could have experience. You could start your own little mini farm here and sell produce and learn to become sustainable because that's really what they're teaching here. Whether you want to be a permaculture, uh, you know, a permaculturist and have your own farm or whether you want to be able to have the skills to get a job or have the skills to make your own job, to be a contractor. That's what you come here to do. That's what they've been doing successfully and that's what they, the knowledge that they can impart with you. So those are the two main courses that they offer. And these are invaluable. So, you know, if you've been wandering around in the whole permaculture thing and not knowing exactly what you're doing, come to one of these programs. This will get you more on track so that you can take your skills out into the world and be the change that you want to see in the world. So one of the cool things here is that, you know, they have basically five acres to play with and they still got a lot of land, like, you know, that they're not doing anything with. I mean, in the back 40, they got, you know, a chicken tractor and they're creating fertility with chickens and all kinds of crazy stuff. But this is an area that was actually recently done by one of the trainings that they had on site and they created this, uh, this pond system here. And you know, ponds, in my opinion, especially on a five acre property like this, they're like essential. You gotta collect your rainwater, you know, and you could buy plastic drums and you know, different things to collect the water. But even better than putting all your water in a drum, you know, or a, you know, a, a container like I showed you guys earlier, is to have a pond. I mean, this is where nature collects water. And so in this way, you're creating, you know, a habitat for wildlife. You can grow more things, you know, different kinds of things that grow in the water. You can create microclimates that provide habitat. And, you know, even for something like, you know, frogs and stuff will live in here and they'll come out and they'll eat all the bugs in the garden, right? And then they'll go back in the water. And, and you have now a storage supply of water. And if you got fish in the water, then you could create, you know, use the water to irrigate which is using the fish fertility, you know, to get that out to your trees. I mean, it's just really cool. And even more than just the pond, they actually have a setup where actually they could convert, divert the water from the pond into this uh, little area here that actually acts as a natural uh, filtration for the pond. So let's go ahead and flip the camera around and show you guys that little setup now. So this is the setup here that basically they take the pond water, they filter through this rock layer where they have you know different uh, microorganisms and plants to basically clean the water before they send it back to the pond so i mean if, if we look at like nature systems and how nature works this is how nature works and it's actually being duplicated in an aquaponics type system you know where they actually have a bed you know out of like rocks where you put the water through and there's microorganisms in there and they're basically breaking down the fish poo to make aquaponics work but before there was aquaponics there were systems like this out in nature, and these are the types of things you'll learn if you come to the programs here, which I think are amazing. All right, so now I want to share with you guys something real cool I just saw. I'm filming another aspect of the garden, but this is just all stuffed in a corner. And this is a solitary bee habitat, and it's just like one on steroids. I'm sure this was a project for one of the courses they ran here. I've never seen anything this big. It's like a little house here, uh, like a little small raised bed, maybe two feet by three feet with a little roof on it so nothing could get wet. And you know, this is a, like a four by six with holes drilled in it for mason bees and they got all these other, you know, uh, bamboo tubes where like, uh, you know, bees and creatures could nest in and hide in. In addition, they got this, uh, this uh, like uh, material here, like uh, that they put together and they just drilled holes in too so even more little creatures could live in. I'm still at loss, like what this is, this is just all kind of rubble where other creatures could live in as well and looks like it's attracting some spiders instead of the bees. But I don't know, it's all, all kind of cool stuff I always learn, you know, when I come to places like this and I'll see new things that I want to share with you guys. So <laughs> there you have it, the ultimate bee house, solitary bee house. All right, so now I want to share with you guys actually what they're doing on their property line, or at least this one. Um, and I would encourage you guys to do this also. They're growing fruit trees. so. You know, they got a, a, a irrigation ditch that's gonna once again direct water down this ditch when it's really wet. The, root, the tree roots of the uh, trees are gonna soak up the water, uh, you know, when it needs it. 
and then uh, they got it also, uh, you know, wood chip down to conserve water. Also, the wood chips will break down and provide fertility for the trees. They got trees like uh, the pomegranates, the figs. Um, they got some cherry trees, some apples. And right now, it might look a little bit bare because they basically got fruit trees maybe every 10 feet or so. And it's currently, uh, you know, fed on a drip line because they are younger and not fully developed yet. But over time, as they have more classes come through here, this will be developed into the full-on food forest. So the first step is they got the fruit trees. Next, they're going to start filling in the smaller trees and plants. They're going to support the fruit trees in their growth. So yeah, using the edges, you know, to grow fruit trees, especially the fruits that hang over your neighbors could pick, I think is definitely a good idea. Also, they can provide, you know, wind breaks so that, you know, your, your farm, your land does not, you know, it cuts some of the wind down. And, you know, I think, uh, always using the edges of your property using out to the extreme edge i like to trellis things up my walls and my fences and stuff to grow the most amount of food possible it's just a smart thing to do in this day and age when property can be quite expensive in some places so now i just wanted to share with you guys like one specific plant actually i happen to like a lot it kind of grows like a weed for me when you regularly water it here i don't know how much water it's getting but this plant seems kind of small to me because mine just grew out like massive but this one what we're looking at here, this is known as the uh, Cape Gooseberry, also known as the Poha Berry, also known as an Incan Berry, also known as a Golden Berry. There's so many words for the same thing. And these are sold as dried superfoods at a health food store for, I don't know, $12, $15 a pound or more. But you could easily grow them in your garden. These are related to tomatoes. They're more hardy than tomatoes, in my opinion. And to me, they actually taste better if you get them right. So much like a tomatillo, they have like a little husk around them. And these are the green ones that aren't quite ready yet. What you're gonna wanna do is let these guys ripen up on the plant, and then they're actually gonna drop off. So you can see them in different stages. We got green ones here. We got some ones that are turning you like yellowish. Oh, this one came off in my hand, literally. That means it's ready. And so we're open this up. This is nature's candy, right? Candy has paper and foil wrappers that are non-recyclable. This is 100% recyclable, 100% compost. But look at this. Open this up without touching, even if you have dirty hands and you're in the garden, even if you're one of those germaphobes that don't like to wash their, that likes to wash their food, you don't have to deal with this, because this is wrapped in paper, uh, nature's wrapping. Pop out the berry, wow. That's a really good berry. Now, I've read somewhere where they say this is one of the rare plant foods that may contain B12, vitamin B12, which, you know, meat eaters say vegans are deficient in, but in reality, you know, uh, the population as a whole is deficient in B12 because it's because in my opinion the B12 deficiency is caused by the loss of soil nutrition and more importantly the soil microbes so anyways I'm gonna go ahead and eat some more of these <laughs> to potentially get B12 but also to have some amazing flavor and taste explosions in my mouth all right so you caught me <laughs> one of the reasons why I love coming to farms and making videos for you guys so that I could eat <laughs> eat my lunch so what you have here, man, we have all these amazing, like, blackberries, like, super ripe. And uh, this is what I'm going to eat, at least for a snack today. If I sat here long enough, maybe I'll eat them all and be full on blackberries. Nothing better than fresh-picked blackberries. Because I'll tell you, blackberries at the store, they suck compared to ones that you pick at the optimal ripeness. Yet another reason you guys should start growing your own food if you're not already and uh, go outside right now and harvest some of the food you grew and pat yourself on the back. Good job. All right, so now what we're looking at is the greenhouses that they have on site. They have two greenhouses, one and number two. And they use this to uh, do plant propagation, start seedlings, all this kind of stuff. And uh, one of these greenhouses actually cost them less than $100 to build. And I hope 80% of you guys get this one right because it wasn't the one on that side. It was the one on this side. <laughs> So they actually have a video on how to build the greenhouse for under $100 and I'm going to go ahead and take you guys in there and share with you guys real quick how they did it and uh, also more importantly what they're growing inside and a new discovery for me that I never knew before in my life. So this is their $100 greenhouse and how this worked is that they actually got one of those uh, carport structures you know you could buy at Costco but they didn't get it brand new they got it on Craigslist you know for free or cheap because what happens is those carport structures, they got really solid frames, but the problem is 
the outer covering usually wears off, goes bad, and the people don't want to buy a new covering, and they just get rid of it. And hopefully they're not throwing away, hopefully they're putting on Craigslist for free, so one of you guys could get it. And basically they got that outside frame or shell, and basically they just built a wood, you know, on the outside of it, uh, you know, on the ends to basically make a two doors, like frame it out so it's nice and solid. And then basically they just, uh, you know, uh, stapled, uh, you know, and, and wrap the plastic, the greenhouse plastic, don't just get the cheap painter's plastic from Home Depot because that stuff's not UV and it's going to degrade faster. So you want to make sure you get some good UV stabilized plastic that's going to last for several years instead of getting the cheap stuff that you're going to replace more often. And they just uh, out outfitted it and they have two openings on either end and that's their greenhouse. And that's how you guys could do it too. I mean, there's always a way to reuse things to get to your goal instead of having to buy new things. Sometimes it might be a little bit more funky, but it's gonna save you money and allow you to grow food. I'm all for it. Anyways, let's go ahead and go into the greenhouse and share with you guys this new discovery I made today. So what they're doing inside the greenhouse is the propagating apples. So they got basically different rootstocks and they basically uh, grafted on different varieties of apple trees. Now they're doing testing between different rootstocks. So one of the commonly available rootstocks is the M3 rootstock, which is basically like cloned. It's all the genetic, you know, uh, similar to every other M3 clone out there. So the challenge is if there's like some disease that hits the M3 rootstock, all these guys could be wiped out, right? But we want to create a re resilience and diversity in our plants. So what they're doing here, we got the ant rootstock. And with this rootstock, it's actually really not even a rootstock, it's actually a tree. It's an apple tree planted from seed. So yes, it's a rootstock, but from seed, not from a clone. And it's a seed that breeds true to seed that's an apple, which is actually very rare, because normally if you get an apple seed, you plant it, you're gonna get you know a random apple. This is what Jenny Appleseed did way back in the day. And a lot of apples that are just growing randomly are just like, they're known as cider apples, because they're not good for eating, because they taste horrible, but they're good for making cider. But the ant, to Novka um, apple, and that's a A N T O N O V K A. I believe it's like a Russian apple. It's true to seed, so you could plant the Antonovka seed. You'll have the Antonovka tree that'll make the same exact style dessert apple, which is really cool. But also, the rootstock's always the same, and it's a pretty uh, hardy rootstock, and the trees grow pretty large. So they're thinking that, you know, uh, in the coming years of drought this is gonna have a nice big root stock that the trees might get large but they can control that by how much water you know uh, they're gonna get and because the root stock is gonna spread out a lot more it's gonna be more drought tolerant you know than otherwise so they're gonna get comparing like the M3 to the ant uh, to Novka <laughs> apple and they got the uh, Spitzenbergs on these guys and they got you know different kinds of hover pippins Sierra beauties and all different kinds of apples in here that they're experimenting with and this is really cool you know for me learning about an apple that breeds true to seed I gotta double check this myself and I, even more importantly I want to taste this I've tasted the Spitzenberg I don't particularly care for it but I want to taste this new variety that is true to seed that you could also graft onto of course you can graft onto any rootstock but they might not be as resilient and here's the benefit of, of growing on this particular rootstock right say your graft doesn't take you know something happens and the top grafted part of the tree that's now the Spitzenberg doesn't make it. If the rootstock continues to grow out, which usually the rootstock stays alive, then at least you're gonna have a halfway decent tasting apple instead of growing on an M3 rootstock that may not make any apples at all, maybe they make small cider apples or who knows what, right? So yeah, it's always like, uh, you know, there's always backup in resiliency and uh, <laughs> I like that a lot. So anyways, uh, let's go on to another area of the farm that I want to show you that actually I don't usually get to show you guys too often. All right, so the last thing I wanted to share with you guys today is this section of the farm right here, and this is the section that probably most people don't get to see, but I thought I'd share with you guys because it is important to me, right? It's about being more ecological and reusing instead of throwing things away where it goes to the landfill because there is really no away. It doesn't get obliviated like, you know, the phasers obliviate you in Star Trek and then you disappear. Some, everything always has to go somewhere. Everything that man created has to go somewhere. You know, things that nature creates, guess what? It does go somewhere. It always gets composted back into the soil, but things like plastic and other things don't go back in the soil. So I'm glad here 
what they do is they reuse a lot of the stuff. So they have like, I don't know if you guys see in the back, but they have all these nursery flats and pots and piles of stuff and piles of irrigation tubing and, you know, metal and uh, fencing material that they could use to make trellis structures and all this stuff. So they have a storage area where they have all this stuff. In addition, they do composting, worm composting. They even use the uh, office shredded paper, you know, sensitive documents to uh, feed the worms, all this kind of stuff. So I always want to encourage you guys to reuse things. And yes, I know, you know, if you had a farm, you could dedicate some space to like your, you know, junkyard area or recycling area. Um, it's a little bit more challenging in a house. I have a, a whole bunch of things I save and reuse. And sometimes it gets a little bit out of order. You know, and my girlfriend, probably not the biggest fan of all my extra stuff that I've collected, because you never know when you're gonna need it. But what I would like to say is that there's a nice balance of things that you should keep and things that you should, you know, discard and maybe even move on. If you're not going to use it yourself, don't just throw it away. Put it all on Craigslist for free. Get to know networks of other gardeners in your area. Say, hey, man, I got all these extra pots. You know, you guys want some extra pots? I don't, I don't have a use for them. I already have 200 extra ones already, right? And so this is the kind of culture that I want to see, you know, a free cycle culture where things are just recycled, given to other people, and they're just simply thrown away and discarded, which then they're not used to anyone anymore. So the last thing I want to do today is actually sit down with Ryan, the director here at the Permaculture Skills Center, and talk to him about the center and some of the programs that they have for you guys. If you guys want to learn more about uh, you know being sustainable, starting a business, or being being able to be gainfully employed and having the skills that employers are looking for, so that you can work in permaculture and you know create a living, but also better the planet at the same time. So now I have the pleasure of introducing Ryan, the program director at the Permaculture Skills Center to you guys, who's gonna talk more about permaculture as well as the program. Uh, so Ryan, the first question I have for you is, uh, you know, what exactly is permaculture? Because people think it's this, it's that, it's an herb spiral, it's a food forest garden, but yet you guys have like row crops here. What, what's going on? Yeah, so permaculture is basically a design tool and it's really a design tool for designing regenerative human settlements based on the patterns and processes of nature. So that's a really big umbrella and it's really great at supporting folks and sort of looking at the resources they have at site and then matching those with the goals they have and assessing appropriate solutions for that context. Place-based solutions basically. Cool, so is aquaponics like, cause that's trying to model nature, is that like kind of, could that be permaculture aquaponics? Yeah, I could say, I think it definitely could be permaculture, but it's not necessarily, it's not inherently permaculture, right? There's, there's places that are incredibly inappropriate to be using aquaponics <laughs> as well. And so I think, like I said, permaculture helps you arrive at appropriate solutions for place as opposed to imposing them, having this idea, I want aquaponics and, you know, putting them in and maybe a really sunny place in the desert where they're losing a bunch of water, say, or, you know, whatever have you. And you're, you're fighting against nature then to have your aquaponics system, then in that case, you're not doing permaculture, that's inappropriate. Wow, wow. So, I mean, this is truly the answer for like the ills of society today where we're doing very too many inappropriate things, right? Exactly, and I think so often we've seen our society fall apart because we're, we're trying to fight against nature. We're yeah. imposing our ideas upon place, upon nature, upon these natural systems that are already cycling, you know, they're already working. And so in some ways you might think about it like you hop in the river and you try and swim upstream, right? And you're just draining <laughs> yourself of energy and there's so much energy that goes into sustaining even like staying in the current there where it's like we could totally flip over, kick our feet up and you know, <laughs> drift be down. in observation of what's on the horizon but but cruise along mm. with nature, with the flow, right? Wow, I mean that's just, I mean this is kind of the same principle in my opinion of like chemical fertilizers and pesticides. They're trying to like go against nature, get some artificial man-made stuff, because man-made stuff's better, you know, success through chemistry, well, failure through chemistry, in my opinion, we're polluting, we wouldn't, that's what I try to do in my garden, I just teach you guys, like, modeling nature, making compost, wood chip soil, adding in, you know, trace minerals that, yeah, maybe from far off in some places, but that, that aren't in the ground before, and modeling nature to the best of my ability, using today's technological advances, even something as simple as trucking, so I could get my rock dust from Canada. Well, try to get it local. There's local stuff too. But anyways, uh, so Ryan, um, so that's great. And I think everybody out there, especially if you're looking for a job in farming or agriculture, don't just go and start a farm. You know, you want to get involved and have a good permaculture background. So I think it's important that a permaculture skill center like that's been developed and is in place here, helping people get jobs, create their own jobs in permaculture. You know, how can the skill center here help with, with them, Ryan, for people that want to 
do something and form it. Yeah, so at the base, we really came into existence to support people in doing just that, bridging the gap. You know, they hear of this notion of permaculture, maybe they've taken a 72 hour design course as well, which oftentimes is just enough knowledge to make you dangerous. <laughs> uh, and so for folks who want to go deeper and take it out of this place of hobby and actually take it into a place of profession, our programs are here to support them in bridging that gap. Uh, oftentimes that's helping them find focus mm. and it's getting the hands-on skills so you can actually embody this knowledge not just see it in great videos like this as a, maybe a starting place or in books but like actually get out and build the competency how to do it and then pair that with the business training and professional development mm. to actually create a career out of this as cool. well. Cool, that's awesome. So I mean besides just the farming career that you could start and I think it's very important to do you know permaculture design farms and grow food and grow high quality food for people like I teach in my other videos but there's another aspect because, I mean, even at big, you know, corporations, they have landscaping. All these places have landscaping at their corporate offices and everybody's home, even if they don't want to grow food. You know, talk about, let's talk about the landscaping design stuff you guys do, uh, as well as the farming, you know, approach that's most often thought of as, you know, permaculture. Yeah, so we basically teach regenerative land management or, or land stewardship through two pathways. We have... Uh, our farm school, which is an eight-week intensive, followed by a six-month mentorship for folks who want to go into agriculture. Business training is a huge part of that as well. And then we also have our ecological landscaper immersion program, which is based off of the proof of concept, our, our sister business on the site here, the permaculture artisans as well. And so that's for folks that want to go into ecological land management, sort of broadly defined. That could be landscaping or that could be stewarding really large broad acre pieces of land as well. And like you're saying, there's a huge opportunity, particularly in the Western US right now, though all over with this uh, emerging issue of drought, right? Like the new norm, we're starting to see that play out right now. Like lawns are quickly falling away. And in place of it, we're seeing these productive landscapes as well. The rock and front yard gardens like you're often highlighting or maybe for folks who want to be a little bit more hands-off, it's more of a, a habitat garden with a couple of fruit trees in there as yeah. well. But whatever it is, there's this huge opening and they need the professionals to help people design and install these landscapes. Yeah, I mean, I think really the big part of the program that I see missing out of a lot of permaculture places that I go to is the whole business aspect. And this is not a nonprofit, this is a for-profit business that's successful for over 10 years and they're gonna share their knowledge on how to get you successful too because, you know, if they win, you guys also win, and this is how it should be in culture. You know, if I win by making this video because I feel great about it and I help you guys, you guys are also winning, and hopefully in turn you guys will help somebody else, you know, get them to grow the, their own food, get them to eat the, their own food that they grew, and just make the world a better place one person at a time. So, Ryan, do you have any final comments or things that you'd like to share with my viewers today? I'd say just go out there and start doing this stuff, you know, like... Don't worry about the perfect timing when, when things like, you know, people are often like, oh, when I get a house, I'm going to do this. You yeah. know, when I have the money, when I have the time. And I think this planetary moment is really calling all of us to get out there and start experimenting, start playing with this stuff. If you like it, if it calls to you, you know, come out and see us. We'd love to help you turn it into a profession or just come and visit us as well. You know, there's no front gate on the front of the, the Permaculture Skill Center here. And this is a community resource. We invite people to come and, and drop in with us. And then I really encourage people, too, to start thinking about the more than profit businesses, as John was talking about. That's what we're trying to help incubate here in the world. How do we use these more than profit businesses to move positive social change, plant more trees, sink more water, grow more gardens, and provide more well-paying jobs? I think it's really an essential part of this whole thing. Wow. I mean, I agree with that all, especially the part that, you know, you guys could start today, even if you live in an apartment condo, you could get self-watering container you know, you could get, you know, pots. I mean, you could find a local community garden. There's all kinds of ways you could grow your own food. So, Ryan, if somebody wants to learn about the programs you guys have here, what's your guys' website, your address, your contact information so that people could contact you about, you know, enrolling and, and getting going to fast track themselves to success in this whole permaculture field. Yeah, so find us at permacultureskillcenter.org. And again, my name is Ryan Johnston. And I'd love to give you a tour if you want to come out and see us or exchange emails with you as well and answer any questions you might have. All right, Ryan. Well, thanks for having me out today, and thanks for the tour and thanks, uh, and being on the show today. I hope you guys, you know, really got something out of this episode. You know, whether that's just you're going to start saving your own water, whether you're going to take out your lawn and put in, you know, a low maintenance, you know, a fruit and medicine, medicinal herb, and you know, a low water use crops like I showed you. Whether you're going to, you know, maybe plant some more row crops doing a no-till method, or whether you're going to build a cheap hundred-dollar greenhouse. You know, I try to have my videos full of a wealth of knowledge that you guys could learn and grow from. And that's all that I hope, you know, that my videos cause and institute just a little change in the world. Because, you know, everybody can make a change in the world, but it's gonna take all of us to come together to do this. 
and at a grassroots level because it's not happening from the top down. So if in any case, if you like this video, hey, please give me a thumbs up to let me know. Also be sure to ch check that subscribe button right down below. I have new videos coming out about every three days or so um, on new topics. You never know where I'm gonna show up, what, I'm, what you're gonna learn about on my show and I guarantee every show you're gonna learn something. And be sure to check my past episodes. I have over, I don't know, probably like 1,100 episodes now that you know have been viewed over 35 million times approximately and over 240,000 people that follow my work. So you know, I want you guys to be able to benefit from my work that I put out there free for all you guys to watch so that I could do my part to make this world a better place and I hope you guys do as well. So once again, my name is John Kohler with GrowingYourGreens.com. We'll see you next time and until then, remember, keep on growing. All right, this is John Kohler with GrowingYourGreens.com. Today we have another exciting episode for you and what we're gonna do today is give you guys a tour of my front yard garden. As you guys can see, here's one of my neighbors and due to all the watering restrictions, he didn't wanna deal with the lawn anymore because everybody's lawn is like turning brown because they're not watering because the lawns waste a lot of malt water. 